Welcome to this week in Missouri politics on a pretty somber week in state politics. We are joined by uh, Senator Dave Schatz uh, from Franklin County. Senator, welcome back to the show. Thank you. Appreciate it, Scott. Uh, February 22nd, 2018 will be uh, known as a, one of the darker days in the history of state government. Uh, the response has been pretty swift. The House has opened an inquiry, a committee to investigate the matter. Uh, I believe that kicks off Monday. I think uh, tomorrow you'll see there's been an announcement some of the Republican women are going to make a statement. Um, your your floor leader, Senator Mike Kehoe, sure. has made a statement pretty eloquently talking about Navy SEAL and leadership and, and, and paying respect to the governor, but basically saying the state is bigger than any one person. Uh, I know these events are happening rapidly, but what's your reaction today? You know, uh, when you wake up and you see the front page of the Post-Dispatch, and, and unfortunately, um, uh, that's not what I intended, you know, necessarily look forward to waking up with, but uh, uh, we were concerned that obviously something like this could occur. Uh, but I think uh, one of the things that I want to make sure that we let, allow the process to move forward, uh, you know, the investigation process move forward. But at the end of the day, I think the, the statement that Senator Kehoe made is probably appropriate as to whether or not uh, how we go forward, uh, regardless of the investigation and whether or not uh, the governor may have the ability to uh, garner the support and ability to lead you know, throughout this process and whether someone needs to maybe take a look at stepping aside simply because for the betterment of the party. Uh, and I think that that's the question that's going to be at hand. Uh, unfortunately, we do need to allow the investigation to occur. I think it's appropriate that the House uh, takes the appropriate steps as well. And as, as the, that investigation goes forward, uh, I think that as those facts uh, become uh, more uh, apparent, uh, then we'll deal with them at that point in time. It's uncharted territory for sure. the state. Yeah. You've navigated those waters through your career, maybe more than most people have. Um, you're someone many people believe will be in that leadership room going forward. Uh, would you echo Senator Keogh's statement about maybe it's time to think about the state being bigger than any one person. Sure, absolutely. Uh, again, I put a lot of uh, trust in Senator Keogh. I think as, yeah. as probably most people would believe that uh, the, the statesman that he is, uh, he, you know, his thoughts and comments have been well measured, well thought out. They're not knee-jerk reactions. Yeah. Uh, I think that uh, that's the kind of leadership that he's provided, uh, and that's the kind of leadership that I'd like to provide going forward in the future. It was pretty swift. Uh, Speaker Richardson uh, uh, Elijah Har, Representative Vescovo, came out uh, that same evening and said they're going to start sure. the inquiry. Uh, what are your thoughts on as that committee began to twerk? Well, uh, in my experience, I, I came into the House with Speaker Richardson uh, eight years ago. This is our eighth year together. Again, I, I trust Speaker Richardson. Uh, I know his character. I know what his decision-making process. And so for them to, to move forward in this fashion, again, it's well thought, uh, it's measured, uh, and I'm certain that it's the right, right and appropriate measures to take going forward. There was one detail that came up was um, the, the law firm that represents the governor in his criminal defense hired a lobbyist. Sure. The speaker said uh, on Thursday that he would meet with that lobbyist. He just would not meet with that lobbyist on this issue. Is this something where you'd see a lobbyist on? You know, I guess I would have to understand the context of what they need a lobbyist for. Uh, again, I typically, you know, I will meet with lobbyists on issues, but I'm not sure uh, what issue he could be bringing forward in respects to this issue here that would be relevant uh, for us necessary for us to meet with them. So, uh, I don't. Again, I don't understand uh, the process of why they hired a lobbyist, but obviously, it's, if it's a PR campaign. Uh, or whatever they're trying to accomplish with that, but uh, I would be mm -hmm. concerned as to what, what relevance that would have uh, in, in uh, having a meeting with myself. Last question on this. It appears that some of the Republican women are going to step forward and, uh, and make a statement. Uh, it seems like that would have a unique impact on this situation. Sure. Uh, you know, Senator Riddle uh, is, is there. I think that uh, is, is going to be fourth. Senator Crawford mm -hmm. as well. There's some other uh, senators, uh, women in the Senate that might uh, also weigh in on the situation, but I think it's going to be very impactful. The words that they say are going to be very impactful. So, and as we, uh, and, I, and I'm hopeful that those statesmen will also be measured as well. And so we'll look forward to uh, seeing what they have to say on this issue. Let's talk about some of the actual things that are happening in the Capitol outside of the scandal. I know. Obviously, when you, like you said, when you see the front page of the Post and the Star, and it's the mugshot of an indicted governor, it's um, hard to talk about other things. But let's talk about some of the things you're actually working on. Uh, sure. I, one thing I talked about this morning on a radio program uh, in Franklin County was that one of the bills that we passed through the legislature this week, the third red, uh, that Senator Sater carried uh, on the opioid uh, mm -hmm. problem that we have yeah. and limiting the amount of, of uh, uh, opioids that could be prescribed. I just think that's one issue that uh, I've been passionate about uh, throughout my career on trying to get a handle on the opioid addiction that we have. And so it's good to see that we move something forward in a positive way that I think will 
have an impact on uh, on this issue. I think in, in 2016 we had over 900 people died from opioid related deaths. Uh, that's a staggering number. Uh, every day in the United States uh, over 91, 92 people die from opioids and so I think it's something and taking steps, moving policy forward that addresses that is something that I was glad to see that we accomplished this week. Uh, there's a multitude of issues that I think the Senate and, and the House as well has both been working on uh, and, and continue to try to make uh, Missouri uh, a better place to, to live, work, uh, do business, and attract businesses here in the state. Uh, we've addressed energy policy. Well, let's talk about transportation. Though. Sure. That is something yeah. where, I mean, it, it, am I wrong to think that throughout all the, the haze of this scandal, it looks like some of the adults are getting in the room on transportation. I mean, there's a, there's a knee-jerk, you know, cut everything. Uh, you know, and I get that, but but transportation is actually an investment. That I mean, if you're going to do business, you have to maintain things. If you own a business and you spent no money maintaining the, the equipment, that's not conservative or it intelligent. It won't. It won't. You won't yeah. be in business very long. Yeah. Uh, and and again, I have. I was on the transportation as the chair of transportation in the House for two years. I've chaired the Senate uh, Committee on Transportation as well, uh, and we've been dealing with this transportation issue for uh, a number of years. Every year that I've been there, we've been talking mm -hmm. about transportation funding. Uh, you know, I served on the transportation task force, and, and I believe what we are bringing forward. Obviously, we're going to be able to ask Missouri, citizens of Missouri if they want to make an investment on transportation. We've had a little hesitancy in the past that the House uh, would be able sure. to, to br have the political courage to bring up uh, a, a referendum that would allow the voters to, to choose. But I have filed legislation that would allow for a 10 cent increase on, on d gas and diesel. And I truly believe when you look at just what we're trying to do with that is we're trying to replace what inflation has done to our motor fuel tax. We've not raised motor fuel mm -hmm. tax since 1996. The 17 cents that we adjusted it to in 1996 now can buy about eight cents worth of uh, labor, uh, concrete, all of those things associated with that. So just raising it simply by 10 cents per gallon would get us to the point where we would still have the same buying power uh, that we did in 1996. And I think it's inherent. The one function that state government does is provide for infrastructure. Yeah. And when we can't continue to ignore that and delayed investment only costs more in the future. So a follow-up question on that. You know. You're a business owner of Franklin sure. County. I'm a simple hillbilly from the boot hill. To get from where Popper Bluff is to Franklin County, you need roads. I think MoDOT, I mean, some folks watching this will remember the 92 plan and different things. I think MoDOT, under its current leadership, has actually gained the trust of people. I think, I think that was the, one of the sticking points people could point to, but I see MoDOT maybe more as an asset in this campaign to raise the taxes, not a liability. No, they, they've obviously done a tremendous amount. I think uh, the director, Patrick McKenna, has done yeah. a fantastic job with the resources we're given. Uh, you know, Scott, we have, we have the, the seventh largest footprint in the nation uh, of roads and bridges in the nation, and we're 47th in funding. But I think that if you ranked us as in our efficiencies, I think we rank 12th in the nation in efficiency in the way our, our department is run. So giving credit to MoDOT, obviously they, they've seen the need. Uh, they had uh, consolidated uh, biz, you know, areas of, of their, uh, their, their operations. Uh, they've sold equipment. They, they're 1,500 employees less than they were in the past. And we're seeing them make the tough choices and able to just rely on the resources that we have. And, and right now, we've been treading water for several years and just maintaining. Uh, and we're not being able to make the critical investments that we need in, in growth in the event that we do begin to attract industry. You know, we need to continue to invest money in, in our roads, our bridges, our ports, uh, you know, multimodal systems and transportation. And, and that's one thing I think, like I said, MoDOT has earned the respect and trust that they're doing a good job. Well, I have you here on the last topic. We're talking about your, uh, your running uh, for Senate pro tem. It's, a, it's yes. an election amongst your colleagues in the Senate. Sure. How's the campaign going and why you're running? You know, I think it's going fine. Uh, I, I think that, uh, again, part of this whole process is uh, over time developing uh, the relationships mm -hmm. of the people that you uh, hopefully would get the support to do. Uh, and, and naturally, I think in my career throughout my life, I have been in a position of responsibility and leadership. Uh, so it's something that I come very na naturally uh, to that point. Uh, and so making that decision. But I think that as people probably would understand that I'm a guy that wants to be able to bring people together, put the right people in the right rooms, and try to work together to come to some reasonable uh, process where we can, uh, you know, there's going to be times when we're not going to agree. But if we can come and bring people together and negotiate and get, uh, get people in a room instead of yelling at each other and talk to each other, at the end of the day, I think that's what people are looking for. They're looking for leaders that would be able to do that. Uh, you cannot be an immovable object uh, and be in that particular position. And so 
Uh, I think that in my past, and I think that people hopefully will have recognized it also, that if I am able to, I can do those things, but I also, if I tell them that I'm going to accomplish something and I give them my word that I follow through with that and, and have been pretty much true to that uh, throughout this whole time, and I think that's what's going to make it uh, easy for them to hopefully be able to sort me, support me in that situation. Well, Senator, I want to thank you for joining us, especially on this particular day on this week in Missouri politics. Sure. We'll be right back with our opinion maker panel. Joe Manning, maybe the most respected reporter in the state, joins us after this. In 2008, Republic Services acquired the Bridgeton Landfill in a merger. Since then, we've invested $200 million to clean up the site and to maintain environmental compliance. We do that while staffing the facility 24-7. That's because we support permanent solutions that are safe for our neighbors and clean up the environment. We're committed to doing what's right. That's what drives us every day. We're a part of the community, and we're here for the long haul. Republic Services. We'll handle it from here. My name is Eric Phillippe. I'm a veteran, a carpenter, and a father. When Eric Greitens said he was going to change politics as usual, folks like me didn't think the first thing he'd do as governor was take dead aim at our jobs and our families' livelihoods by working to repeal prevailing wage. Call Governor Greitens. Tell him to protect prevailing wage and to protect my family, not destroy it. At Amer in Missouri, we know what light can do. It draws people together and chases monsters away. And if you shine it in the right direction, it will light the path for the next generation, showing them what their tomorrow could look like and spotlighting the possibilities that lay in front of them. Investing in our community by lighting the way forward. That's energy at work. Amer in Missouri. Welcome back this week in Missouri Politics, our Opinion Maker panel now. Ray Hartman, uh, publisher extraordinaire, uh, Donnie Brook founder, welcome back, sir. Thank you for having me. Representative Mid in front of the show, welcome back. Always a pleasure. Very delighted to have Joe Manning's on the show. Well, thank you for asking me. Thank you very much for being here. And Representative Kathy Conway, thank you for uh, joining us. Uh, the, uh, the, the issue that's obviously going to stop all the political world is the governor's indictment. Um, not often, maybe not ever, does the sitting governor under an indictment about something like this. Uh, interesting. It, the speaker took a while to process this, wait for this development. When the development came, the same day, Speaker Todd Richardson, Elijah Haar, Representative for Leader Viscovo, put out a statement saying they're going to form a committee to kind of find out for yourselves and get to the bottom of this. Um, one, a little gratifying for you. Two, you were an early person that pointed this out. But two, uh, what, is the, what is your colleague's reaction right now? My first reaction was just total sadness. To see our state have to go through this, I, I really don't feel vindicated or happy dance or anything like that. It's sad. As I digested a lot, listened to a lot of other people uh, last night, today I'm a little more angry because what I asked the governor to do at that time was to consider stepping down because only he knew what the outcome could be and what else was out there. So now I'm a little angry that we all have to go through this at a time when we had such high hopes in the Missouri House and in the legislature to get a lot of our agenda done. So this is my eighth and final year there. Um, I've had an adversarial governor for the first six years and it looked like that didn't change now. Joe Manage, you've seen a lot of Missouri politicians come. You probably maybe talked to more of them than anybody else in the state from the reporters uh, reporting angle. Never seen nothing like this. No. I mean, you, there's been a lot of cases where there was a lot of rumors, a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes. A lot of stuff, you know, because we're not, none of us are perfect. And a lot of politicians have had personal failings. But this is out there. I mean, when you have the mugshot of the governor on the front page of every major newspaper in the state, I mean, that's, whether or not it's, you know, he ends up being guilty or innocent or whatever, still, there's that image. And as uh, the representative just said, he's the only one who really knows what else is out there. And that's been the big rumor for months. Ray Hartman, yeah, you worked in a Republican governor's administration back in the day under Kit Bond. Much better behaved. Clearly. Um, back in the family values days of the party. Uh, Even your adversarial governor was much better behaved. I mean, I mean it, it is a startling development, right. though. Right. Yeah, it is. And um, uh, his, keep in mind, his argument originally was with a tape. I mean, the, the tape of a yeah. woman 
thinking she was talking to her husband. So this is not your normal Me Too thing where somebody's coming out with some bold accusation. This was sort of evidentiary. I mean, she for the, I've said before, to believe Greitens' initial story, you had to believe she was telling the truth for the first half of her tape to the husband and, and only lying about the parts that were bad for him, you know, which was the, the photograph and the alleged blackmail. I would point out that the bar for convicting him, and we should not convict him of anything, he's entitled to his criminal presumption of innocence, but the bar for for convicting him and the bar for fitness to serve are two different things. And I think he's already uh, kind of had his, his three attempts to get over that bar, uh, hadn't done it. Representative, you've uh, you served in the legislature. Uh, it looked to me like, you know, there was a thought that maybe this was over. He was certainly saying it was over. This is clearly not over. Absolutely, it's not over. I mean, the man's been indicted for a crime that I think is uh, important to recognize, so. Let's talk about the legislative rundown. You know what your colleagues and the leadership in the House have said. Across the uh, aisle in the Senate, I thought maybe the most impactful comment came from the Senate floor leader, Mike Kehoe. He talked about, he was a Navy SEAL and, you know, command, and, and sometimes the part of that command is stepping aside. You know Mike Kehoe. He does not make flippant comments. Um, probably no greater statesman in the Capitol right now. I do see a lot of folks following his lead and saying this is uh, the time for this kind of sad part, chapter in the state should be over. Well, I think folks already have, but I also think that it's really important to remember that, you know, this indictment is sort of the, 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 the most recent chapter in a long list of chapters that start with an inauguration for which we do, still don't know how it was paid, uh, a new Missouri, overpaying the we Department of Social Services. <laughs> so we have a very, you know, this, this governor ran on integrity and cleaning things up, and he has shown repeatedly over the past, whatever, it's been 18 months, that he's unable to do that. I mean, as you know Mike Kehoe, yes. and you know state politics, um, his statement was articulate, but it was a statesman's way of saying it's time to end this. Do you think people follow? I think some people will. I think so, because once you have people who haven't been like calling from the get-go, who are now saying, "Look, you know, this is it's time. You need to move on." But I think this highlights a the fact that the governor has never had close alliances with anybody in the Republican Party, has made nasty comments, called people part of the swamp, made all sorts of name calling of fellow Republicans, run ads against fellow Republicans. Then all of a sudden you're in a situation where you need their support, and when there's a story out there and they're seeing your behavior on other issues, they're thinking, why should I believe you now? Why don't we just move on? Let's try to get this behind us, especially with an election coming up in, what, eight months? You know, uh, Representative, there was a time where there was the quote at the beginning of this year, I said the actions of this body would not be defined by a few. I was serious and I'm serious now. That's how when I was a mate of the, aware of the situation, I asked him to resign. Uh, that's what Todd Richardson did with uh, a representative uh, last session from St. Louis County. He did. Uh, it looks like he took a measured approach, but at the end of the day, uh, you can't say this is not a distraction at this point, right? Well, no, absolutely not. And, and that representative had the good sense to step down and not be a distraction. He owned up to uh, his responsibilities to the body. I think what got me the most is the very day we sat in the state of the state and were lectured about ethics. We were lectured about ethics for five minutes. Mm -hmm. And two hours later, we find this out. I, I don't know where the line is with this governor. Well, to your point, I think it's some kind of new, uh, you know, gold medal for hypocrisy. To, I mean, it really is. I mean, and politics, that's saying something. No, I mean, it really is. It's, it's so exactly what you're saying. I mean, this guy is so the antithesis. And one of the things should be pointed out here, it's not about partisanship or, or about yeah. the issues. We're all in our silos on a lot of issues. Yeah. This one, what, to, your, to Joe's point, that, Everything about this sordid scandal is corroborated by the guy's own persona. In other words, whether you're talking about kind of this whole bully thing, remember when he had the, the phone call with, uh, uh, in Rudy. the primary? Right. With Rudy. Rudy. Right. This yes. is consistent in a lot of ways with everything he's sort of, even when he's trying to be positive about it with his, you know, his kind of macho thing, Everything about this is not hard to believe. You could plug in any other governor that you can think of in the recent history, Republican or Democrat, and say these are the set of facts, and you're going, no way he would have done right. it, or you know, no way it would have happened. This guy, it's kind of like you got to look at the persona that he has created for himself and how corroborating it is 
to the tape, which, as I said, wasn't even an accusation. It was a, a conversation. Let's, let's talk about his response to this. His response to this was to, after these allegations, he mistreated this lady in his basement. He comes out and attacks Kim Gardner, the first African-American woman elected to be the circuit attorney. I, I can't say that anybody I've talked to was surprised. Right. Well, I think I think that Ray's absolutely right. You can't run as a bully, behave as a bully, and then expect us not to believe that you bullied this victim. Okay. So, and Kim, look, Kim served in the legislature. I think that she served honorably. I think that she was respected on both sides of the aisle. Uh, and to sort of call this now a partisan hack job is, frankly, I think it's ridiculous. This went to a grand jury, and an indictment came down. The grand jury did its job. We can argue about the judicial system from now until Tuesday, but that's those are the facts. And. Um, and I think that Kim has behaved, I think Kim has behaved as well as any circuit attorney should ever behave. She's, she kept her mouth shut and she did her job. I saw the quote on uh, the public radio's Twitter account from the governor. Um, I mean, it was 12 citizens. He chose to live in St. Louis City. Yeah. It was 12 of his neighbors that, that, that chose to, to move forward with this case. I don't think the response was surprising, though. No, I, although it does surprise me from the standpoint that to immediately pivot to attack, I'm not sure, I mean, just tactically, forgetting yeah. everything else, that if that was a smart move. Because, again, it wasn't uh, the circuit attorney sitting in a chair saying, I'm going to issue an indictment today. It was these 12 um, citizens. We don't know. And many people on her staff, she's got some Republicans on her staff or some conservative Democrats who yes. are well respected as the investigator. I think that it would have been... I'm not sure if it was a tactical move to just go after her right away and go after all these other people right away. It, it becomes him against the world. Some of uh, some of his most loyal supporters have complimented Judge Durker, an Ashcroft appointee, as saying that if he says something happened, if it happened, and if it didn't, it didn't. Uh, but I would say if you were following at Greitens, you weren't surprised by this, which is more of the same. No, I, I really wasn't. Um, a little contrition goes a long way. and. People are very anxious to forgive their leaders. They want them to be good leaders. They want them to be successful, but they have to have a little humility too. And I think to turn around and blame the circuit attorney's office for doing their job, uh, if, if it had been just her uh, issuing a, an indictment, that would have been awful. But this was a true bill from, like you said, 12 people. That carries a little more weight. The reckless liberal theme works in a lot of places on a lot of contexts, but not this one. Because first of all, as we point out, it's just not valid here. It's, 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 this is the criminal justice system. And, and, you know, if he's exonerated, that's one thing. But, but he, the, the idea that this is some kind of reckless liberal, I think, a, a plot, it, it's just, it's so, it's, it's actually as insulting to some of the fine Republicans who've st already stepped forth, that... step forth in the terms of, on the, on the decency, right. family values front, and and to make this him himself a victim, I, I think he he is trying to sort of take a page out of Trump's playbook, which is to to go at no, I mean Let's, to go out to make it to, to the, go to his base when he's in trouble. And I mean that some to go to his base. Side of the aisle, though, the Democrats, um, the response has been a little bit muted, uh, more so than you would have thought from this. Uh, the the response to Al Franken's situation was was very muted or very excited <laughs> compared to this. Is there a little bit of Cheshire Cat on the Democrat side watching these Republicans uh, stew in this scandal? Well, I, I, you know, look, the criminal justice system needs to play itself out. I think that we said pr pretty much the same thing with Al Franken. We've said this uh, in all contexts, at least our leadership has. So I don't see why this should be any different. And the criminal justice system does need to play itself out. There's been an investigation. There's been an indictment. Let's see what happens next in the city. Okay. I, I think the less the Democrats say, the better. And, and, and I mean... Probably it, politically right? Well, no, politically, well, okay, selfishly, politically, the Democrats certainly want to wake <laughs> up on, you know, the mid middle of November, the day after the election, and this has still been in the news and hasn't been resolved, obviously. But I'm not talking, the Democrats don't control anything in Jeff City. Exactly. So the point is, I think it's actually bad form for the Democrats to be particularly loud about this. Uh, it, to me, there, this is actually one of the few issues that sort of bring Democrats and Republicans together a bit. And I think that well, the Democrats, the state, the Democrats ought to take great effort. They don't control anything, but they ought, to, they ought to say exactly what Gina just said, is just let the process play out. I think plenty of Democrats have already expressed their indignation about well, this. If you're, on the, if you're on an issue that you don't want to see pass in the Missouri General Assembly, you desperately want to see Eric Greitens stay in the governor's office. If, you, if you're trying to pass some anti-labor bill, some anti-trial attorney bill, 
you definitely are better off if he stays than a honeymoon period of a Mike Parson who probably just sits in his office and signs bills. Possibly. And I think that, I mean, for Republicans, okay, for Democrats, it's probably better that they be quiet because, I mean, like most politicians, they'll, they can push it too far. But I think for Republicans, I mean, here he was out there campaigning as a um, family values candidate. See, that's part of it yeah. is because he was out there trotting out his wife and the two, two little boys and all that. And I'm not denigrating that. But the fact is that if you look at the timeline, he was mm-hmm. still Adulterer. engaging in this affair for months after this picture was taken by his own admission. So he launched a campaign knowing this stuff was fairly recent history. And that's risky, not just for you, but for your party if it comes out. And this is, this is for him, the worst case scenario. So, but, but when you look at the, the political landscape, I mean, maybe Democrats uh, probably know they benefit from having him there and are a little more quiet than you might think. They might be, but you know, like with Representative Mitten, we've gotten to know each other well over the last six years. And I have a lot of the Democrats. We have good relationships. We don't always agree. I think that she grieves as much as I do over what's happening. And to have people like me and other friends of hers have to choose between defending him, condemning him. Um, I, take, I take some consolation in the fact that we do have Todd Richardson and, and Mike Kehoe yeah. there because I think these are two guys that get it. I think they're very fair. I think they're very reasoned. And I do trust them to lead us in the direction that's gonna be best for the, the family, the governor, the state, uh, the parties, uh, everybody. Interesting. I'd say I, I, after 40 years of <laughs> going back to this, I'd probably fancy myself as the most cynical person on this panel about, <laughs> about Jefferson City. And, and I, I really respect what you're saying. I, this is really not something that ought to be about politics. There will be, of course, political fallout Absolutely. within the Republican Party, whatever. I think this, this what's, what we have here, and, and it does go beyond this particular incident. It does include things like the dark money and some of those things, which I would argue are not Republican at all. But I think this is a time for people to come together in the, in the, in the state house. And I don't think it's, it's helpful for, for it to become partisan in any way. Well, uh, we'll talk about the political fallout on the coming weeks here on the show, but with a minute left this week, who won this week? I don't think anybody did. Yeah, oh. that'd be the case. I would say in some ways it'd be the Democrats and actually Claire McCaskill, just because the focus, I mean, uh, Attorney General Josh Hawley was trying to do some attacks this week. Nobody even knows what they were because it all got swept away by this. Sure. Who won the week? I'm going to say women and teenagers because despite all the stuff with the governor, the House did pass a couple of really important bills, including raise the age for marriage and the revenge porn bill, which is frankly quite appropriate. And my hope is that both of those bills will make their way through the Senate. I got to go with George Washington. It was his birthday. The guy that couldn't <laughs> tell a lie. Guy gets indicted who can't tell the truth. I would say you may have won the week with that quick. That was out. I watched it on Donnie Brook and it was outstanding here. Uh, I'm going to say Representative Gene Evans, who did carry that bill, and I'm going to say Republican women. I think next week will be led by Republican women making sure the right thing is done yeah. for the state. So hopefully we'll have a more, uh, more positive week next week on this week in Missouri politics. See you then. This week in Missouri politics brought to you by Spire and Sterling Bank. She's not a kid, but she's a kid to me. She um, is kind and um, complicated. She's kind of a little quirky, but she has the greatest personality. She's always up to do things, wants to do fun stuff. Well, Melanie has Down syndrome. She has some definitely health issues. Um, she has a speech impediment that makes it difficult for her to communicate. So a lot of things she has to maybe show you or she has a hard time getting words out. Yeah. Where was this one taken? Uh, uh. Is that your aunt's house? She gets up and then she gets herself dressed. Puts her dirty clothes in the hamper. She's very self-sufficient that way. She comes into the kitchen and staff provide her medication for her and she takes it. 
and then staff prepares breakfast for her. We have her wipe off the table. She might need a prompt to do that, but she does that on her own. Three days a week, she goes to program for Easter Seals, and she does a lot of activities throughout the day with that. She is thriving with independence, being in this, in this house, in this program. She's very happy to be here. This is her home. It's an amazing journey that has happened to her. She says she'll visit her family, but she wants to come home. So she feels like this is her home. And there's nothing you can make better than for her to be like, this is my home. We're working on different things all the time. So it's a continuous work in progress. Um, we're looking at having her learn her address and phone number. That's been difficult for her just to memorize it. But we do repetition every day. You want to go look for some DVDs? Okay. I don't know where she'd be if there wasn't for Easter Seals. She would be um, probably having a less fulfilling life. I'm very grateful to Easter Seals for the um, opportunity that she's been given. I've seen huge changes in her since she's been here to be on her own. And this is the best way that she can be on her own. Where's your home? Here? Yeah. This is your home. And I love this job. There's not a day that I don't want to not come here. And I know I'm making a difference. You can see that Melanie's happy. And that that's probably our biggest goal, is we want our individuals to have rights and freedoms. And you can tell that she's very happy with that. She gets to live her life on her terms. And she's happy doing it. Who's in this picture with you? Daddy. She lost her dad about four years ago. And they were very tight. They were very close. and. I'm sure he's smiling down right now. We help people with disabilities be as independent as possible. We help them live out their life as full members of our community. People with disabilities want to do the same things you and I do. They want to work, they want to be valued, they want to have friends, and we help them achieve those goals. We have to set priorities as a, as a society, as a state of what's important to us. And I think supporting individuals um, with disabilities is a really important thing for us to do. It's honoring the dignity of every human being and what their capabilities are and what their potential is and allowing them to pursue whatever that is. Many people with developmental disabilities need lifetime care. So we have a choice as a community. We can put them in institutions and nursing homes, which is expensive and inhumane, or we can help them live in the community and be as independent as possible. We can teach them the skills that maximizes their ability, whatever that is. That's good not only for the individual with a disability and their family, but it's good for the entire community. That happiness that comes, that fulfillment, that dignity that people are allowed to have when we embrace the opportunities that are out there for people with disabilities is something that ripples across society. And so it obviously has an impact for that individual, but for their neighbor to see that individual working and having those interactions and then that spreading across our state um, is an important thing. I think that that just, it, it should color how we view the world and what our priorities are. The hope and opportunity that Easter Seals offers to people with disabilities would not be possible without the support of our community. Our donors, volunteers, neighborhoods that welcome people with disabilities, and our champions in Jefferson City make all of this possible.